Uh, a few sort of caveats at the beginning. Uh, before people start asking me complicated legal questions or regulatory questions, uh, I'm speaking partly as a clinician, partly as a researcher, uh, and some of my answers, particularly with regard to what can one do about providing naloxone, uh, I'm primarily coming at this from the, the very simple standpoint of a clinician working with my patients or clients. You can then take the question further about how do you make that more widely available, but I actually think that's, uh, that's the position uh, where it's best to start from in the consideration. I get asked by colleagues, why do I think the whole, this whole issue is so important? Uh, well, it's because uh, opiate overdose and overdose deaths uh, are the main cause of death amongst the population uh, that we're dealing with. Uh, most of these overdoses are actually witnessed, uh, so there's an intervention opportunity which we fail to harness, and most of these overdoses are witnessed, and both peers and family have opportunity to intervene if only we uh, empowered and enabled them to do so. So I'm quickly going to go over what's the problem, when does it occur, how could naloxone make a difference? And then uh, also, where do we seem to get ourselves into a mess? One of the things that opiates do is they turn off your breathing. They turn off your respiratory drive. And if you give yourself an intravenous plug uh, or intravenous bolus of something that turns off your respiratory drive, it's not surprising if you stop breathing. And if you do that for too long, uh, you die. It's from where we've measured people's uh, oxygen level in their blood and I'm um, sorry about the colours, one of the dangers of copying these slides from one machine to the other is all the colours change but, uh, but along the top is what happens after somebody's had uh, intramuscular heroin uh, but if somebody's had intravenous heroin uh, you get this rapid reduction uh, in, the, in the oxygen levels in their blood and this essentially is the bit that we particularly need to worry about uh, that's where somebody's oxygen level is plummeting uh, in those first 5-10 minutes or so after an intravenous injection. Uh, it happens however the opiates are taken, but the, the particularly critical bit is after intravenous. Uh, and this is one of the people that we were studying. Uh, <clears throat> the dotted line is roughly where in a intensive care ward the alarm would be set to alert the nursing staff that something critical had occurred. Uh, and this guy goes way below the line and bobs back up. Uh, in a slightly morbid way, I actually had reasons for being hooked up to one of these machines. Um, uh, in hospital for a short while, hooked up to one of these. And I tried getting myself down to these levels, um, such as the sick behavior you engage in when you're sitting there in a hospital bed. And they left it with the screen in front of me. And I thought, look, I'll, I'll simulate my own opiate overdose and see how low I could get. I couldn't get anywhere near these levels. You know, my brain was just firing off saying, breathe, you damn fool, just uh, breathe. Way, way before I got down to anything like 90. Okay, so w which drugs are involved? This is one of the other reasons, because I, you know, I, I'm now sort of, uh, sort of gray and grisly, and I've worked in the sort of field a long time, and sort of uh, younger colleagues come along and say, you know, why are you going on about opiates and heroin and such? We've got sort of trendy new drugs which are more interesting. Uh, and I go, yeah, but just look, if we're interested in, you know, in deaths, and as, as harms go, death is a sort of pretty profound harm, uh, let's look at where the deaths occur. Uh, and these are, these are UK data, uh, but uh, if you look at the prevalence of opiate use, or heroin use, it, it's almost irrelevant. I mean, the, the, the prevalence of opiate use is so low, you wouldn't have thought it was a worthwhile area uh, to be interested in. But when you then stack that alongside where the deaths occur, uh, you find an incredible concentration of the deaths in this small prevalence of opiate use. So how common is this? Now, as a clinician working in the field, I didn't come across people regularly coming in talking about their overdose experiences. And I came to then realize that it's just because people I'm dealing with are such nice, decent folk that they come in and they don't want to upset their, the clinician they're working with. And you know, some event occurred at the weekend and I was, sort of unaware, I was unaware of it. Uh, once we started surveying both treatment and non-treatment samples, uh, this was an early study we did looking at 
uh, people way before the point of their entry into treatment. Uh, so <clears throat> uh, these people, half of them were within their first few years <clears throat> of heroin use. Uh, most of them were taking it by chasing the dragon, so they weren't, uh, they weren't injecting. Uh, they, didn't, they had dependence scores that were incredibly low. And even amongst this group, uh, you had about a quarter of them who'd already had an overdose. And particularly in a conference looking at injecting risk behaviours, the, the striking observation we made with this group was that when you looked at young heroin users in London, uh, we had a mixed population of people smoking it and injecting it, <coughs> chasing it and injecting it. The only ones who were having overdoses were the ones who were injecting it. So the particular risk behaviour was not just heroin use, but was heroin use by injection. And amongst those who were injecting, uh, we found um, you know, getting on for 40% uh, had already had an overdose, uh, and half of them had witnessed an overdose. We then engaged in a sort of international competition with colleagues, particularly in Australia. You know, so Australia were not going to be outdone by our percentages. Uh, so uh, people like Shane Dark, you know, so you both Adelaide, you had Adelaide, you had uh, Sydney, basically showing that London. London heroin users were nothing compared with uh, Sydney and Adelaide heroin users. And there were <clears throat> higher incidents, uh, higher rates uh, of both having experienced and witnessed overdoses. So from a, a naloxone point of view, the idea of naloxone being part of what one would provide, it needs to involve opiates. It probably needs to be in a home context, or it's better if it's in a home context where somebody's supply of naloxone might be, and there needs to be someone else present. Uh, we've looked at uh, the scenario from debriefing people about their own overdoses they've experienced or they've witnessed, uh, and suffice it to say that uh, more than 80% uh, of those overdoses uh, are witnessed, more than 80% are with peers present, and more than 80% are in some sort of home situation, uh, both for personally experienced overdoses, uh, also for witnessed overdoses. And the figure that I found most sobering as someone who was both a clinician and a researcher was that amongst the people that I was actually seeing in a, in a treatment context, you know, about a quarter of them had actually witnessed an overdose death uh, now, that actually meant I was seeing a potential intervention workforce. They had been there at the time that they could have done something better and didn't know what to do. And that's what needs to be corrected. So we've got extensive witnessing of the overdoses, but are people willing to intervene? Because even though they're there, uh, you, know, you get sort of negative press coverage saying, oh yeah, but this, you know, this is a group of people who wouldn't be willing to intervene. Uh, so we started surveying people about, well, which sorts of intervention would you be willing to do? Uh, and we then broke it down into, would you be willing to do this with somebody who has a sort of close friend? We got into slight complications, would you, a close friend or partner? And then we discovered people were more willing to resuscitate their friend than their partner. And we thought we, sh we shouldn't sort of go, we shouldn't go there any further. It was, you know, we're only talking about sort of one or two percent difference, so, you know. But, um, and uh, it just seems surprisingly high levels. So we then moved up a gear and we said, so well, okay, you know, if you're so smart about what you say you do, and you've actually been there and overdosed, we brief you about what you actually did, uh, and had a large number of responses. Uh, and the point here is that these are quite active things to do. So we had people putting putting people in baths of cold water. Let me hasten to say, you know, if you've got someone who's unconscious, putting them in a bath of water is not a very smart thing to do. But it's an indication of a willingness to actively engage in the resuscitation effort. So the obvious challenge was to say, well, tell people what they ought to be doing if there's this amount of willingness to intervene. So you've got witnessing of overdoses and you've got evidence of a real commitment to do something about it, even if it's incorrect. Uh, so it fits the identikit picture perfectly of it, involving opiates, often in a home context, uh, often mostly with peers present. So when does it occur? Uh, well, we can. It, it's not just an arbitrary risk. We, I mean, it's there as a background 
sort of random risk, but we know there's some concentrations in time when this occurs. So post-detox and post-rehab, you've got increased vulnerability, uh, but let's look at these in a little bit more. Uh, we looked at the data, um, sort of large data set from uh, general practice uh, in the UK, and let me just sort of quickly guide you through this. We, we looked at overdose, uh, at the likelihood of people actually having died. So we looked at death data of people who had begun an episode uh, of maintenance treatment with methadone or buprenorphine. Uh, and what you find here uh, is that the line through the middle is basically a, a, more, a mortality rate of one being what their likelihood of dying in any period of time was uh, after they'd completed their treatment. Uh, so you have in your first month of methadone treatment, you have an increased risk of mortality. We, we've recognized that for the last 10, 15 years, that during those first few weeks, it's a riskier time whilst you're getting somebody onto their maintenance treatment. But you then get to this period here, throughout the period of somebody's time on maintenance treatment, when they have a significantly reduced mortality rate. So they have a lower mortality rate than when they eventually come off. So that's the safest period of time from a mortality point of view. But the bit that's crucially important uh, is that when, when somebody ends their period, when somebody comes off their maintenance treatment, uh, which includes whether they go into a detox or a rehab or just come off in the community, you have a rebound increase in the mortality risk. Uh, so it's a course of action somebody might choose to make but they need to be aware that it, it's a course of action that has hazard associated with it. Rather like if somebody was coming off their anti-epileptic medication or off their anti-hypertensive medication or antidepressant medication, you'd say, we've got to watch you particularly carefully because there's a period uh, when we could discover things go wrong. But the real concentration that's much larger than any other is during the period uh, when those first few weeks after people come out of prison. Uh, and let's just look at how much that concentration in time is. So uh, various colleagues, uh, Sheila Bird or Sheila Gore as she was then, uh, and uh, Mike Farrell and John Marsden, uh, so colleagues of mine from the, from the UK, done a number of studies, they've now been replicated uh, in other countries around the world. And prison populations are really important from our point of view. You know, whatever one's view on imprisonment as a sanction, it, it, society gathers together people with drug problems and puts them into prisons. You might think it's, it's a good idea or a bad idea. It's a phenomenon that happens. So a behavior that I was saying in the UK is way below 1% prevalence rate in society. If you survey people in the prison population, uh, you've got more than 25%. Uh, so the two bottom columns are both uh, people who, when you interview people in prisons, uh, either have uh, either previously had uh, a heroin problem or a heroin and stimulant problem. Uh, and both male and female populations, uh, you've got more than a quarter of that population uh, in problem. So. In terms of numbers, that's where there's huge numbers of what you might regard as our, sort of our target population. Uh, and if you then look at the patterns of their deaths when they come out of prison, I'll take you to this slide and sort of guide you through how to, how to interpret it. Because once you, once you uh, see the basis of the calculation, it's a quite horrific graph. So, so this is your excess mortality ratio. It, this tells you how much in any month or any week are you more likely or less likely to die than somebody else of the same age as you in the general population. And so let's look at the right-hand bit of the slide for the moment. You, know, you have over here, you know, this, is, this is slightly higher than one, you know, several times higher than one. So just by being in this population coming out of prison, you've got an increased mortality rate, uh, slightly increased. Uh, the, the little blue bit at the top uh, are causes that are nothing to do with drug use. You know, this might be appendicitis or getting knocked over by a bus or something like that. Uh, but the, 
when I, after being at the State of Origin match, I don't refer to this as the maroon colour, but anyway, the, the, the whatever colour, you, 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 let's call it maroon anyway. <laughs> you know, that, uh, whoops, sorry. So, that, so that's doubled uh, by virtue of being a drug user, that there are drug use related deaths. Those first few weeks, that first fortnight after coming out, coming out of prison, you have this horrific pile up of deaths uh, in, in that first fortnight after coming out of prison. 30 to 40 times uh, the, the risk of dying compared with the guy who lives next door to you in the street who happens not to be a drug user coming out of prison. So you've got an increased risk just by your career choice of being a heroin user, and then in those first few weeks, it's five to 10 times greater again than just by virtue of the career choice. So how could naloxone help? Well, as, you know, as Paul was saying, it was, it was in Melbourne, horrific, it was 20 years ago, that the idea sort of first began to germinate that maybe we could do something. You know, if we've got this problem of heroin overdose death, uh, within medicine, we're used to the fact, you know, for nearly 50 years now, uh, we, we've had the antidote. Probably the most famous coverage of what it was is from Pulp Fiction. The only problem with Pulp Fiction is that, you know, Tarantino obviously hadn't trained as a, as a sort of nurse or a medic before he went into film. You, you don't need a, a needle that's about a metre long, and you don't have to drive it through somebody's heart and pin them to the floor to, to achieve it. But anyway, but it... But the sense of crisis and emergency is magnificently captured in the film. I have it on my computer. I can do all the voices. Uh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> Perfect time. Uh, in the UK, I, all of the naloxone products are not really well suited to our use, but they're good enough. Uh, and if I was a family member, you know, if my son or daughter or partner uh, had a heroin problem, I would want naloxone at home just in case. And even if it wasn't the perfect prepared product, you know, this, the one we have in the UK is too large a dose and it doesn't have the needle attached, but I can cope with that. Uh, hopefully over the next few years we get better products. Uh, and the first serious consideration of it was some work that uh, we did with uh, Shane Dark and Wayne Hall and Roy, uh, looking at, you know, should we take this seriously? Back in 1996, we sort of started debating it, saying, you know, hold on, this is more than just a sort of crazy idea. You do it with uh, adrenaline and an EpiPen. If someone in the family has a peanut allergy, why don't we do the same uh, in our area? First time we seriously started exploring it uh, was at the very end of the 90s. Uh, we started surveying uh, both our uh, patient population and also the non, uh, our community non-treatment uh, populations that we were already doing some interview work with. <coughs> and basically we found high levels of endorsement of the fact that that population said, you know, roughly said, I'd prefer not to die and I'd prefer my mates not to die and if you've got something uh, that, can, that can help me become more competent in that area, let me know about that. Uh, the other issue which I, I've become more and more convinced uh, we're missing a trick with is uh, to do with family members. Uh, w when you speak to family, uh, of, you know, whether it's partners or uh, parents of people uh, with heroin problems, uh, they generally think they've had very little help from the system. And to say to them when they're sort of 10 years into struggling uh, to support their son or daughter, oh, by the way, um, we could have taught you about how to manage the overdose situation, uh, and we actually have also have a sort of an emergency antidote injection. They're shocked that uh, we have had that resource and have never let them know about it. This was a hugely important project. It was the first project we had that had its own T-shirt. Um, <laughs> and uh, in particular, uh, we were keen to embed the whole naloxone story and the fact that it, was, it wasn't an alternative to other interventions. First of all, we wanted to make sure that people continued to call an ambulance. So we, we, we have sort of simple material about how to recognize an opiate overdose, uh, simple actions that you take 
uh, within which the naloxone is there, but it doesn't replace these. It, it has a supplement to those. Uh, we we realised very early on that intramuscular was so much simpler. Uh, I've actually had to give naloxone to, to in a crisis situation twice in my life. Uh, you know, having trained as a psychiatrist, uh, so I was originally a real medic and a psychiatrist, and the idea that I was having to find a vein was a pretty terrifying prospect. Uh, I, to now realise I didn't need to, I could have just given an intramuscular injection. I feel cheated about the trauma I went through. Uh, families would presumably feel so even more so. It's so simple to give an intramuscular injection. Doesn't even matter if you don't get it deeply in, subcutaneous would be fine. You do have to push it hard enough to get through the skin. If you just sort of spray it on the surface of the skin, I think that probably wouldn't work. Uh, putting people in the recovery position. Now, who's the target? Well, we aren't just... Uh, I've concentrated on people in treatment because they're an accessible population where there's a pre-existing contract, there's a pre-existing relationship, you know, a doctor-patient relationship or a therapist-client relationship. So they're an obvious group to deal with. Because in fact, they're probably the least at risk because they're in treatment. But they're a population who might become at much greater risk and they're also a very good starting point for saying, having got our working practice clear with this population, let's now extend it further. But when you're very much wanting to look at those who are an out-of-treatment population or, or are not properly engaged in treatment, and in particular those who are abstinent and in recovery. You know, since we know that that population is at high risk of relapse, and when they relapse, the mortality rate around that relapse is particularly high. Uh, they're a rather obvious group uh, to deal with. And in the UK, we're in some early discussions with a couple of drug-free residential rehabs about the fact that should, should this perhaps be part of the preparatory work that they do with the family. So quite interesting discussions, but a very obvious, valuable group to deal with. And, most internationally, most of the effort has been uh, to do with engaging peer groups uh, to be empowered to resuscitate your fellow drug user. I think that's a very worthy avenue of work, but I'd say this is only one of the avenues. So clinicians should be aware, just as if you were treating people with seafood allergy or diabetes or epilepsy, you would make sure that the family around the index patient was properly trained and empowered. I think clinicians need to realise this is part of their responsibilities uh, to do with the, the wider care of their patients or clients. Uh, and family members are hungry for the support and the information and training, certainly from work uh, we've done with them. And once you begin to look at who else is there, there are all those other non-medic colleagues working with this client population. You have people running hostels for the homeless. Uh, you know, and you suddenly start realizing, yeah, there, there are people where part of their job, uh, if within that population they were having people who were having epileptic fits, they'd soon be saying, you need to know how to manage a fit. Well, our equivalent of that should be saying you should know how to manage an overdose if it occurs. Um, I'm going to skip through this lot to the last few slides. Uh, yeah, just, just to tell you, we're, we're in the early to mid stages of a massive uh, research study in the UK looking at the deaths that occur after prison. Uh, it's called the N Alive trial. Um, doing, I think colleagues had met with Sheila Bird, who's one of the, uh, the, the three of us are involved uh, with doing the trial together. Uh, we got a rough background to the study in a paper a month or two ago in the Journal of Urban Health. Uh, it's a huge trial. Uh, we're looking at reducing the death rate. Uh, in our pilot phase, we've got 5,000 uh, people coming out of prison. Uh, to begin with, I thought this was complete non-starter, and then you suddenly realise there's actually no shortage of heroin users coming out of prison in the UK. Uh, they say, oh, you only want 5,000? Oh, that's no problem. Six months or so, we'll sort that out. Uh, it's taking a little bit longer than that, I have to say, but anyway. Um, and uh, we're then looking at whether 
by provision of training with emergency naloxone do we reduce the death rate in those first few weeks after prison. And we uh, try to make sure, I was talking earlier about the ideal naloxone kit is one that passes the Levi's jeans test. You know, it has to be able to fit in your pocket. Most of the companies that we've approached, they keep turning up with sort of briefcases and say, <laughs> this is all that some, somebody has to have with them. And you go, you know, to be honest, it doesn't really fit the sort of hip image of being a drug user to say, oh, I've got my, you know, got my briefcase with me. So something that is truly portable, th this is what we sort of need to work on uh, at this stage. So final couple of slides about areas of confusion. You, we are a really bad field uh, in terms of moving forward with these things. We seem to have a, an endless ability to think of obstacles and reasons to sort of dither instead of getting on with it. You, it's like dealing with the overdose situation. You can't afford to continue to dither. In the 20 years since we first started talking about this, you know, the number of deaths that have occurred by our inertia is horrifying uh, to think through. People say, well, what if the, you know, what about naloxone has a shorter half-life? What if people go back into overdose? When you go, well, what's the alternative? You know, I've got to tell you, if I'm going to die now, or you're going to give me a resuscitation, and I might drift back into overdose in an hour or so, I'll go for the second option rather than dying now. In reality, it doesn't look as if it's a problem. When you look at people who've left ambulances having had a resuscitation dose, they don't appear in the death data. So they may drift back into a bit of overdose, uh, but they don't appear in the death data. Uh, if we needed to give a second dose for people to take away, then we can incorporate that. People then worry about the date expiry. They say, oh, well, it says on the thing that it's past its expiry date, you know, uh, after two years. Uh, let's be clear, if I ever needed naloxone, I don't ever expect to need naloxone, but if the only supply you had was 20 years old, I'll take that, because it's still going to be about 90%. Uh, would witnesses be a, uh, can you train this population? We've now trained uh, fellow drug users in treatment, uh, fellow drug users out of treatment, and we've trained family members, and not surprisingly, uh, they all increase their knowledge and increase their confidence uh, and then apply it when used. So wh what do we need to do about it? We do need to improve the naloxone. Uh, you know, there could be better versions, more ready prepared for that sort of emergency use. But what we have is good enough. Uh, we need to extend it to wider populations, and in particular to look at where we have high-risk clients and how to engage them. But our biggest problem is our own personal and institutional inertia. Uh, and you know, whilst I'm not on sponsorship from Nike or anything, we, you know, it's sort of just do it is what we need to do. Thank you very much.